Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome to Bouncing Back, the personal resilience science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. Let's get started. Hi everyone and welcome to Bouncing Back. I am your host Tia Harmer and today I am joined by Christine Grace McMulkin, a certified teacher of mindful self-compassion and faculty member of both the Centre for Mindful Self-Compassion and Centre for Mindfulness Studies. She is also a compassion-focused therapist. Today's topic is the relationship between attachment and self-compassion. Let's get started. Hi Christine, how are you? Lovely Tia, good to be with you today. Wonderful. So you've had a very interesting professional life. So before we start, for those who don't know you, do you mind explaining a bit about who you are and what it is you do? Yes, I I would say at this point in, even my mother would say, very interesting career, dear. (laughs) My, My devotion and my focus is compassion and mindful self compassion, compassion focused therapies. And I think for many of us, there's no accident that we find Mm -hmm. our way to this approach and on this path. Uh, My background is in mental health. I'm a social worker by profession and began my career uh, working in a large mental health facility here in Toronto and really around the theme of recovery and mental health and Mm -hmm. was very invested in doing all that I could to change the system and change the system from within. And it reached a point where uh, at one point in my career, I gave to the point of depletion Mm -hmm. and so had a very lived experience of compassion or caregiving fatigue, Mm -hmm. of caregiving fatigue. And needed to step back and really consider what it was to take care of myself and um, to devote some time to doing just that. And when I returned to the field, I realized we really didn't speak a lot about self-care. We didn't invest in self-care for providers, for carers of those recovering their mental health and well-being or or those recovering their mental health and well-being themselves. Mm. And so it became an important chapter for me to talk about the importance of self-care. When I became acquainted with self-compassion and mindful self-compassion, I thought this takes self-care to a whole other place. This is more about my relationship with myself. Self-care are the Mm -hmm. things I do or attempt to do in order to look after myself. (laughs) Self-compassion has more to do with my relationship with myself and Mm. investing in cultivating a loving and kind relationship with myself. Yeah. That's so interesting, yeah, that you've managed to sort of make that distinction and especially, um, you know, that caregiving fatigue. It's not something that we really think about, but it's something that affects um, so many people. So, yes, very interesting career you've had there. So we're going to get a little bit more into those kind of topics later. But before we do that, we're going to ask you some questions. So this is the part of the podcast where we get to know you, Christine, um, so that the listeners can learn a little bit more about you just on the inside. So I'm going to ask you some questions. So what's your favorite book? I would say in a book that has moved me deeply and would it would be my favorite book is The Secret Life of the Bees, oh, wow. which was written by Sue Monk Kidd yeah. and uh, you know a story set in the night in the early sixties, a coming of age story. Mm. Um, so that one certainly has is it about with bees. Me. It's really more about loss and betrayal. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> and interracial relationships. So okay. really, um, I was going to say, too. I love bees. So when you, were, I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds so fascinating. But I get the feeling it's not <laughs> exactly what I thought it was off the bat. Bees are certainly featured in it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Sure. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Uh, what is a movie you would recommend? Well, again, we're going back a few years, and I think there's a bit of a theme here, these coming-of-age <laughs> stories. Another uh, film that I really appreciate was Dead Poets Society, and yeah, that starred yeah. Robin Williams in, um, in a role as a teacher really trying to support uh, young people in a preparatory school to find themselves and find their voices and seize the day. So <laughs> yes. that's yeah, another movie that God, I appreciated. Yeah, it's a beautiful film and I highly recommend, um, yeah, for those who are just interested in coming-of-age films, it is a historical marvel. So, yes, please go watch it. Um, my next question is a podcast you've recently been listening to. Well, maybe not too surprising. I'm drawn to podcasts um, by colleagues in the field mm -hmm. and Michelle yeah. Becker, who actually was one of my teacher trainers in Mindful Self-Compassion, mm. has done a series of podcasts entitled Well-Connected Relationships. Um, and so that is certainly a theme and a teacher that I very much appreciate listening to. And I also like true crime, true crime podcast. <laughs> it does need to be a little bit of balance in the mix here. So, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. We do love a bit of a true crime podcast over here. I will be honest. <laughs> I think yeah, podcasts are so diverse, and you can listen to so many different things. So you know, why not? Honestly, um, my fourth question is: Who is your famous role model? If you have one, some people don't have one. Yes, um, I do. And Thich Nhat Hanh is a Zen master, a Vietnamese monk, oh, wow. not so long ago passed away in this middle 90s. You know, a global spiritual leader, a poet, a peace activist, I say a man, a gentle man, a gentle soul who wrote poetically in these small, beautiful volumes on this theme of mindfulness. Yeah, wow. That's so yeah. interesting. How did you stumble across that? The, with my introduction to mindfulness, and you start to kind of see who's writing and teaching on this topic. Yeah. And he was one of the very early, certainly in this part of the world, um, to, to give voice and written word mm. to this theme of mindfulness before it came the it word. That it, <laughs> that it, um, yeah. Exactly. Oh, wow. Fascinating. And my final question is a course you have completed. So certainly my training in mindful self-compassion. Um, more recently, I'm immersed myself in compassion-focused therapy and done trainings through the Compassionate Mind Foundation and that theme. And grateful for here we are. You're in Australia, I'm in Canada, <laughs> they're in England, I can be in Canada. Just the, you know, the technology that supports us in engaging and learning, mm. you know, from teachers from around the world. So that's been absorbing me in the most wonderful way um, of late. Oh, I love it. That's gorgeous. Yeah, and that's exactly sort of what we're trying to do over here in terms of sort of share things and, yeah, deliver educational content to everybody in the world. So thank goodness for technology. Um, mm -hmm. As much as it can be the bane of our existence sometimes, <laughs> we've had a bit, few tech issues already this morning. Um, but, look, it's allowing us to communicate and all those grand things. So I think it's definitely well worth it. So as I already mentioned today, we are discussing attachment and self-compassion and uh, more specifically how these things affect our personal resilience. Uh, for our listeners, Christine, how would you define personal resilience? The word that comes to mind when I think of resilience is buoyancy. You know, yeah. our capacity to navigate the waves of life and the challenges of life and to kind of bounce back when life throws us a curveball or we go through a challenging time or experience. So buoyancy 
comes to mind when I think of resilience. That's perfect. Yes. And that very nicely it ties into our podcast name, Bouncing Back. That's, that works oh, very well. It was, it was just an accident. <laughs> no, exactly. But that's, you know, it, it all ties into that in terms of, you know, a lot of people believe that or have this kind of misconception that personal resilience is about, um, you know, being immune to stresses and all those kinds of things. But it's not. It's actually just about being able to kind of move with the ebbs and flows and, you know, understanding that life isn't always going to be, you know, happiness and clouds and rainbows and white yes. picket fences. Um, and a lot of the time it's not, but it's being able to get through those things so that you can make it out the other side, um, you know, a stronger and better version of yourself. In saying that, a lot of people, yeah, believe in that misconception that I just mentioned. Why do you think that is? Nobody likes pain. <laughs> Nobody likes pain. Yeah, you know, I, I, when I, when I read, you know, when I, I think of that question, I think of, you know, when I was teaching a course in mindfulness, one of the participants, I must have shared something personal in terms of a life stressor or a challenge I was facing. And her response was, oh, Christine, I thought you were immune to, to <laughs> you know, thinking that the more that you study, you learn, you practice, it'll make you immune to the stressors of life. Mm. You know, I think it, um, life is hard. And so life is challenging. And yeah. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it really is um, understandable why people would rather not or, or would not would wish not to have to go through these trials and tribulations yeah. and somehow that we can avoid them if we, I don't know, teach ourselves, school ourselves, practice enough. Um, yeah, that's definitely. not the way. To, um, John Kabat-Zinn, who's a longtime mindfulness teacher uh, based in the States, talks about we can't stop the waves. Right? We can't stop the waves, yeah. but we can learn how to surf. Yeah, and definitely. so this idea that, you know, maybe we can resource ourselves, support ourselves, help ourselves to navigate life's challenges that are inevitable because yeah. it is part of the human experience, right? The, exactly. The pain and the challenges of, of living a human life mm. is, are inevitable. Exactly, yeah. And no matter where you look in history or religion or, you know, social cultures or whatever, sort of being a human is having an imperfect life. You know, things aren't always going to be perfectly balanced and, you know, well-rounded. Um, and as much as that's what we aim for, it's being able to sort of accept and understand that that's not exactly how it's always going to be. Um, and, you know, you sort of borderline on perfectionism there. Um, so that's why, yeah, we're here to talk about resilience. Why do you think resilience is important in our life? Because life is hard. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. You know, uh, we've inherited imperfect brains that mm. can run interference with us trying to figure out and navigate um, our life experiences and challenges. Um, and so it's inevitable, right? It really is part of the human experience is pain, no matter where we come from, what our life history is, you know, we can anticipate that there will be painful moments in life, mm. losses, tragedies, you know, world events that happen that impact us. And so to carry on living as full a life as possible, you know, resilience helps us to navigate the, these inevitable waves of life. Yeah. Exactly. So we're going to sort of talk about how those two things or how resilience sort of ties into what we are discussing here today. But first, I think we need to define for the listeners in terms of we mentioned self-compassion and we mentioned attachment. Um, but what exactly do those two things mean? How would you define um, attachment, for example? So attachment, I think most of us would connect that word um, with attachment to another, mm. right? To, um, an emotional bond, and most would think of, 
the the first bond, the first emotional bond, you know, the one that forms between an infant and a caregiver, we might say typically the mother, although I'm grateful to see my great nephews being born in Scotland and there being an almost immediate connection with the fathers um, <laughs> yeah. in that birthing room. So oh. but mostly we think of that, uh, that very first primary, all essential relationship needed for survival with an infant and the mother yeah. and the yeah. mother. Yeah, so how would you define self-compassion then? So self-compassion, I think, and I alluded to this, this relationship with ourselves, right? Cultivating a loving, kind, caring relationship with oneself. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to talk now in terms of how those two concepts are related to each other. But first, you know, we're just going to touch on attachment. Attachment, like you mentioned, is this sort of emotional bond um, between one person and another. Um, and so hence it's sort of related to interpersonal relationships and it's often associated um, with self-compassion. Um, but a lot of the time, like you've mentioned, self-compassion is sort of that relationship um, with oneself. How do you think uh, these two concepts sort of relate to each other? How do you think self-compassion and attachment um, connect? So I, I think of the work of Paul Gilbert, who developed compassion-focused therapy and in our program mindful self-compassion program we we reference this you know our physiology that you know we have a threat system that's hardwired for survival we have a drive system that gets us out there gathering and hunting and doing the things that we need to do to to get through the tasks of life and we also have a soothing or caregiving system and so when I think of attachment and self-compassion, I think that we are looking to, to support ourselves in responding to the threats of life, whether they're external and, and often these days they can be internal when we think of self-criticism. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking to cultivate or warm up or activate the soothing and caring system so that we can, can better navigate um, the experiences of life and the emotions of life and for that to come from that, that caregiver that lives within. Yeah. Whether we have birthed or not, whether we identify as female or male, doesn't matter. You know, because we are mammals, because we are human, mm. we have within us a caregiver. Yeah. And yes, of course, this the initial attachment with the primary caregiver, the mother, kind of helps to activate that. But no matter what is still tucked in there, sometimes you get lost or is suppressed or is hidden. And so with self-compassion, we're looking to bring that forth, that compassion itself that lives within us. And that compassion itself can accompany us through, through life's ups and downs. Definitely. So you mentioned before when I asked you sort of to define uh, personal resilience, you mentioned sort of buoyancy and, you know, that term bouncing back and all those kinds of things. Um, how do you think that relates to attachment and how do you think, um, you know, attachment affects our personal resilience on a day-to-day -day level? So when I think of what supports personal resilience, um, I think there are a number of things, you know, one is how we look upon the world, the lens that we look at life and the world through, our attitude, you might say. It's also influenced by, by our connection, right? And yeah. social, we're social creatures, we're human creatures, mm -hmm. and we need connections with 
others, you know, no yeah. matter what. We may think of ourselves as being independent people, but we truly need to be part of a tribe, a kinfolk, a class, a team, a workplace, a family, and and to be part of those connections are integral to to navigating the waves of life and the challenges of life. Yeah. And then also we can think of our personal resources, our schools, our, our skills, our strengths, our capacities, our tools, you know, our practices that support us in building the capacity to, to navigate um, life's moments. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So I think in terms of, you know, navigating, you know, life's moments and all those sort of things, when it comes to social interactions and relationships and being more adaptive when it comes to those difficult interpersonal situations, how do you think... Um, sort of early attachment experiences can influence this? Because obviously there's been sort of a lot of research in terms of the ability to be self-compassionate a lot of the time stems from those um, early attachment experiences. I'm interested to know sort of what your opinion is on this in terms of, you know, is an attachment that builds our self-compassion abilities, um, you know, healthy or vice versa? Um, sort of what do you think of this? You'll ask me again, please. <laughs> That's all right. So um, when it comes to sort of you mentioned kind of going through life's journeys and all those sort of things um, and, you know, different social interactions and social relationships, et cetera, um, a lot of the time the ways that we feel self-compassion for ourselves relate to those early attachment experiences. Um, what is your opinion on this? How do you think... Um, sort of our early attachment experiences can influence the ability for us to be self-compassionate and sort of how can we build on those? Yeah. Yes, we we all have different beginnings in life and, you know, we don't choose who to be, who to who our parents are going to be yeah. or the station in life we're born in or the country or all of that. So... So, you know, certainly I'm a, a person that comes, you know, with a lot of privilege in terms of my own experience. And we know that there are many that, that don't have uh, such opportunities, are much more vulnerable, are much more focused on survival, maybe have endured traumas um, and abuses and, and all of that. And so, and perhaps haven't had secure attachment experiences at the outset and so you know the pathway to self-compassion may be a much harder one maybe a longer one may involve more kind of a looking at therapeutically um, you know what's standing in the way and engaging in a healing journey and a healing process and so the pathway to self-compassion will look different for us all, you know, depending on our stories and our histories and, and what we've endured in life. And yet, no matter what, that caregiver is still in there, is still tucked in there. And so it's really looking at ways that we can, Paul Gilbert would talk about the fears, the blocks, the resistances that maybe stand in the way of us being with ourselves in kinder and gentler ways. So there may be more work. It may be a harder journey. The ways may be of greater magnitude. And yet I truly believe that that it's, you know, it's finding what unlocks the door to self-compassion is mm -hmm. perhaps part of the challenge and, and also the hope that, that we can hold on to. We'll get there. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Exactly. So I kind of want to just go back to something that you touched on before. Um, you mentioned kind of, you know, people feel as though they are, um, you know, independent or those kind of things, and you know, don't need attachment and those sort of things. And just sort of building off what you talked about before in terms of early attachment experiences, um, how does a person know sort of when their independence level 
sort of in terms of how they feel towards other people and their attachment towards other people. How does one sort of evaluate their own independence in terms of being like, okay, I have a healthy level of independence, <laughs> um, you know, and I'm able to do this, but I still obviously need, you know, you know, social relationships. Like you said, we're social creatures. We need those kind of um, interactions with people. How does one sort of evaluate whether, like I said, that level of independence is um, healthy? You know, they're able to be self-compassionate towards themselves. They feel comfortable being, you know, with themselves versus sort of having that extreme level of independence where it's just sort of a bit toxic in terms of they refuse to have any kind of attachment to anybody because they see that as something that may be able to sort of damage them. Well, it's, you know, it's, um, yes, it's, you know, we, we are, we are the same and we're different, right? In terms of what our needs are. I, the quintessential question in mindful self-compassion is what do I need? And, you know, I think of myself, sometimes I need solitude. I need solitude. My yeah. deeply introverted self truly needs some time with myself, right? And I also need affiliation. I'm grateful for my connections with the centers, you know, to be part of a faculty, be part of a team. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and that, so affiliation is important to me. And so... I think the consideration of what I need, what I truly need, uh, can support us in, in distinguishing um, what's best, what's healthiest, right? And um, again, depending on our histories or traumas experiences, it may take some time to really to uncover what I truly need. Mm. Um, yeah. and yet that can be the, the, um, the guide poise post, the point of reference in terms of kind of connection with myself and, and what is most important and what, what is best for me. Mm. So I'm interested to know, so in terms of post COVID, if we can say that, <laughs> In terms of post-COVID, um, sort of, you know, we're coming towards the pointy end um, of the pandemic. In terms of how have you seen people's attachment styles change? Have you noticed anything sort of in the way that people um, interact, the way that people form sort of relationships or social interactions? Have you seen anything in terms of like, being able to notice a change in how people sort of attach themselves to one another or their independence or their ability to be self-compassionate? I'm, I'm struck with how the need for connection with others has been magnified. Mm. You know, we probably were trucking along, you know, doing our thing um, and yet to have forced isolation and forced separation and, you know, maybe limited capacity to physically be with one another or see one another. Um, when I think of my involvements around self-compassion and mindful self-compassion, one thing that Christopher Germer, I just acknowledge Christopher Germer and Kristen Neff, who created the Mindful Self-Compassion Program, Right at the beginning of the pandemic, he, he thought it might be helpful to create a circle of practice and open it to the world and to offer guided compassion practices several times a day, every day of the week. And the response was tremendous. And I've led one of these circles of practice. I'm thinking, here I am now, two plus years <laughs> in. And yet people were so grateful for a virtual way of connecting with one another and created community around those, you know, 45 minute circles of practice. And for me, it was highlighted 
how how necessary and important and powerful community can be. Mm. Um, I always remember one woman saying, I said, no, you can close your eyes and practice. And she said, I'll keep my eyes open, Christine, because this is the only time I get to see people, Aww. even although it's through yeah. Zoom, right? And so, you know, to create, to have a beloved community, to have a place of refuge, to be with like-hearted, like-minded people and just know you can breathe for a while. We needed to find other ways of doing that. And I think Zoom has supported us and other platforms have supported us in being able to connect. And, um, And I just know people come time and time again because they have such longing to to feel connected with others in meaningful ways. And maybe that's part of it too, right? That a longing for meaningful connection with Mm. others. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, even (laughs) from a non-professional perspective, um, yeah, being able to have those connections with people during COVID was so crucial, even when they were just virtual. Um, And I think now we're very much even appreciating how much we need uh, human interactions, like on a real sort of in real life kind of basis. I definitely appreciate so much more sort of seeing my friends and my family sort of in real life because it is sort of, it is different. Um, But I'm still, yeah, so grateful that we were able to sort of take away maybe that that one good thing that came out of it in terms of we all learnt sort of how much we do need each other and how much mm-hmm. um, yeah we need to be loving and compassionate towards each other because yeah we're we're all humans and we all need that kind of interaction and that love on that social level um, and yeah even that woman who just like kept her eyes open for the the zoom I can definitely. Um, I think, yeah, so many people related to that and were able to just sort of um, understand that. I think the only person, who did I get to see? The only person I saw during COVID um, was once a week I saw my physio. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was like the one time, um, and because obviously he was the same in terms of he didn't get to see a lot of people, so our, our sessions ended up just sort of becoming weekly catch-ups um, because we were so desperate for that that human interaction and now like me and my physio are best friends <laughs> because we were the only people that um, we saw during the week. So, yeah, just, um, yeah, being loving and caring even towards yes. people that are, are strangers is um, still such an yeah. important and thing. So, you know, it's our most fundamental need is the need to be loved. We needed to be loved at the beginning in order to survive, mm. right? We needed that early attachment with the caregiver and, you know, in order to to survive. And we never lose that need for love, even although we may pretend that we don't, <laughs> we, we never lose it, right? And so um, I often think of my golden retriever, who is this big brown-eyed girl who, if anyone knows oh, the golden retrievers, they're yeah. all about love, And so she unabashedly, you know, steps out the door, looks to see who's around, who's in the vicinity, who's going to stop and say hi to me, who's (laughs) going to pat me, who's going to love me. And she does that just so openly. Mm. We're more reserved (laughs) when it comes to (laughs) this longing, you know, to, to have connection, to be cared for, to be loved by others. Mm. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So funny that you bring up your golden retriever because I have um, a best friend and his nickname is sort of like golden retriever or Labrador just because that's exactly what he's like when he sort of comes out and he's so like sort of going nonstop high energy but also just like so loving and caring towards everybody and everybody he meets and everybody he interacts with, you know, you talk to any of them and they'll just be like, oh, I love him. Like he's so nice and everybody wants that. Like if we could all be golden retrievers, (laughs) then the world would be a much better place. Unfortunately, not all (laughs) of us are blessed with those um, gorgeous big brown eyes, but (laughs) if we could all, yeah, have that hair too. Um, But anyway, moving on, coming back to – 
sort of different attachment styles? Because I've got a question here that asks um, sort of how does insecure attachment, both anxious and avoidance attachment, uh, influence our capacity to be kind to ourselves? Um, and when I first sort of read this question, I was kind of like, um, <laughs> exactly what do those different attachment styles um, mean? So before you kind of answer that, could would you be able to sort of give an explanation in terms of um, the different attachment styles, because this question mentions, yeah, insecure attachment, um, anxious and avoidance attachment. Um, could you please <laughs> sort of explain <laughs> um, sort of what those different attachment styles are um, and maybe why there are different attachment styles or sort of how? You know, not truly not my area of absolute expertise in terms of in terms of the of attachment styles. Um, you know, I think again our early experiences may influence our later relationships in terms of our ways of connecting or not connecting with others. You know, when I think of an anxious attachment style, I think of, you know, just kind of this um, kind of fear of loss of attachment and maybe engaging in activities that may seem of a kind of desperate, right? Mm. That there's anxiety about, you know, not hearing from somebody or not receiving a reply from somebody or those kinds of things. And so there's anxiety around losing the attachment that influences people's behavior. Yeah. Um, I think of avoidant. I can talk, you know, we can all maybe have personal experiences we can refer to that people that, you know, just shut down or are not forthcoming in terms of caring and love and maybe there's strings attached or rules attached and they really kind of avoid intimacy because intimacy is perhaps too threatening for them. Yeah. And so these, you know, different ways that are perhaps understandable depending on our early experiences, how we have different ways of connecting with others. Again, I think of regardless of you know, what our early experiences are or were. You know, when I think of, you know, one of the significant contributions of a mindful self-compassion approach or self-compassion or compassion-focused therapy is really this opportunity, this capacity we have to heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. if we can cultivate an attachment to ourselves, if we can cultivate within us a secure base, right? A secure foundation. If we can, you know, kind of kind of support the emergence or with support the emergence of um, the compassion itself, we can develop our compassion itself. Mm -hmm. And if we begin to meet our current challenges. Uh, the current pain or stressors of life from that place of compassion itself, you know, or when we, we meet kind of the waves of earlier traumas or painful histories and meet that from a place of compassion, perhaps in a way that we would never receive or in a way that um, we weren't able to because we were just surviving, we were just getting through what we had to get through, what we were enduring, then if we can meet the pain of life, current and past, from a place of kindness and compassion, we can support our own healing. In many respects, we're really looking to become good parents to ourselves. We may never have had a good parent or positive parenting experiences, but we can, we can create that for ourselves. We can nurture that within ourselves so that we can heal ourselves. Yeah, definitely. And I think... Yeah, like you said, even just going back to before when you mentioned, like at the very start, sort of when we were doing introductions and you mentioned um, that caregiving fatigue and just sort of being able to be compassionate towards yourself. 
Um, and yeah, like you mentioned, you have a daughter, so I assume you're a mother and, you know, being a parent comes with all those things, you know, you have that, that parent guilt in terms of, um, I'm not doing enough. I'm not caring about them enough. And, you know, I've seen it in my own mother in terms of, you know, she definitely puts us first. I've got two little brothers, um, and all that kind of stuff. So I guess sort of, you know, from a professional perspective, but also as a mum. Um, do you have advice for sort of people who are struggling with that sort of caregiving fatigue and that ability to be um, sort of self-compassionate towards themselves? Yeah. You know, it, it's a, another sign of being human is um, caregiving fatigue, life fatigue, <laughs> work <laughs> yeah. fatigue, all of, all of those kinds of things. Uh, Kristen Neff defines um, mindful self-compassion, and one of the components of it is this sense of common humanity. And so it's this reminder that we're not alone, right, in this being human, in being tired mothers or, you know, exhausted healthcare providers that it's really a sign of our, our limited capacity to, t- to tolerate distress, emotional distress in the world, mm. in, our, in our work, yeah. in our lives. Um, and so it's a sign of being human. And so there's something around, that's why engaging with a compassionate community or, you know, the, I think the, the programs is they're done with other participants. One of the early realizations is, oh, I'm not the only one that's hard on themselves. That's the overarching theme of everyone I cross paths with is I'm hard on myself, Christine. Yeah. And, and the sense that I'm the only one that is so hard on myself, you know, everyone else is doing better, seems to be managing. I'm not. And so to realize that actually we all struggle, mm-hmm. we all suffer is, is such a relief for many to realize that. Yeah. So there's that element of it. And, Another is kind of the, this mindfulness word, which really supports us in coming into the present moment, right? We are, our minds are hardwired to, to look to the future, to look to the past. And yet if we can practice coming back to this moment right here, right now, we can tune into not only what's happening around and about us, but what's happening within us. And maybe we notice that oh, I'm having an off day, or this is really hard, or I'm having a hard time listening, whatever that might be. Mm. There's something powerful about like, validating our present moment reality and the, perhaps the pain that's included within that present moment reality. So acknowledging that this is a difficult moment reminding ourselves that difficult moments are human moments we're not alone and then from there considering what we need that quintessential question what do i need not to make it all better and change it and you know all of that but actually we offer ourselves compassion not to feel better not to fix things but because we feel badly Mm. because we're, we're struggling and so it's that again befriending ourselves or that caregiver that lives within who recognizes and sees us and hears us and knows and wants what's best for us can support us in in navigating these moments yeah yeah definitely I think sort of do you have any kind of particular sort of strategies because I know you know a lot of parents listening or any professionals or anybody who's ever had to sort of take care of anyone um, even outside of themselves um, do you have any sort of particular strategies that you would recommend you know for example you know mums working mums who are struggling to sort of make time for themselves you mentioned you know you need solitude a lot of the time the only sort of break that you get from a little person is when you (laughs) go to the bathroom and you can shut the door and it's just you (laughs) but you're in like this tiny cubicle and even then you know they're banging on the door and mom can you make me a sandwich or (laughs) sort of things like that um what kind of advice do you have for those sort of people in terms of 
<clears throat> they want to develop sort of self-compassion strategies, but they're not entirely sure where to start because they feel like, you know, if they are going to try and develop those strategies, they would need to, you know, sort of step back in terms of, you know, they need to step back from being as caring as a mom or, you know, as caring as a caregiver or a social worker or those sort of things. Sort of for those people who are anxious <laughs> about having to step back from being a caregiver, what sort of advice would you have for them in terms of how those people can build um, self-compassion strategies? Yeah, it's, I, th I think of things we can do in the moment, right? And um, a few things come to mind is, one is, you know, remembering that we can influence our physiology, right? That we actually, as much as we can't help when our threat system is triggered, we just can't help it. We don't choose to fight, flight, freeze in response to something. <laughs> yeah. We, we actually can activate our caregiving system. And so, you know, th something as as simple and as powerful as offering ourselves soothing or supportive touch. So what by that I mean, you know, this our default is kind of placing a hand or hands over our heart. And some people may say, oh, I kind of do that instinctively sometimes. I mm -hmm. notice that. But it's this idea of, you know, Paul Gilbert would say we can influence the parasympathetic nervous system, the soothing system. We can activate it through touch. And so a gentle hand or hands on our heart, feeling the weight and the warmth of our hand, imagine that coming into our body can support the warming up of the caregiver that lives within. Also, uh, Paul Gilbert talks about to the soothing rhythm breathing and this idea of intentionally breathing in a steady slow way especially when we send the breath down into the belly and kind of keep the chest still let the belly expand we can physiologically help to activate the vagus nerve which again is attached to the parasympathetic nervous system does this does this give us strategies for parenting no <laughs> but it actually helps to helps to yeah. put us in the soothing system and from that more grounded, centered, calm place, then perhaps we can, you know, in a more intentional way, consider what do I need? Maybe I need some support. Maybe I need a mini break. Maybe I need whatever that might be. It comes from, from a grounded place. Mm. Um, so we can soothing and supportive touch, a soothing rhythm breathing, even uh, we do um, giving and receiving compassion and using the breath, like I breathe in for myself, I breathe out for another. If I'm feeling really depleted, I may breathe kind of focusly, focus on kind of that oxygen mask on ourselves first by kind of breathing in and breathing mm -hmm. in, just trying to fulfill, yeah, yeah. replenish myself in order to step back into um, maybe a caregiving situation or a parenting situation. Mm. So breath can help us. Becoming into the body can help us. Acknowledging, um, you know, soothing and supportive touch, acknowledging this is a stressful moment. Um, I'm not alone. How can I, what do I need? Um, yeah. So kind of the idea of I don't have to go sit on a cushion. I don't, you know, it might not always <laughs> yeah. be easy to go and take, have a massage or to take it, but we may not have the opportunity to do that. Mm. So what can we offer ourselves in the moment Yeah. to kind of remind ourselves that we're not alone. We have a caregiver that lives within that's uh, got our back and is at our side. And perhaps from that place, we can step back into life's mm. moments. Definitely, yeah. And I think even just sort of listening to that, we underestimate the influence of just breathing and just sort of like being able to kind of come back within ourselves. And, um, yeah, it's very important and it's definitely something that if you download sort of any meditation app or anything like that, the first thing they sort of, 
sort of hammer into you is, um, yeah, that ability to kind of just like take a moment to sort of reconnect, um, you know, with your breath and your stomach and your lungs and all that jazz. So it's definitely something that I, yeah, recommend, especially for those who <laughs> feel like they don't exactly have the, the time or the energy or the sort of space to, yeah, sit down. And as much as going for a massage sounds really nice. <laughs> it's not exactly doable <laughs> when you've got like, you know, three-year-old twins. Um, yes. So, yeah, it's definitely breathing. Yeah, guys, it's it's great. Um, and it's just, it's just great all around. <laughs> so that kind of brings us nicely into um, sort of our practice habit debrief. So this is essentially where we get to ask the experts, so Christine, in terms of um, what you do to sort of uh, cultivate um, a practice that affects your your attachment styles and sort of improves your uh, sort of self-compassion. Yes. So that's essentially my question is, do you yes. have a practice um, that you do, whether that's daily or weekly, um, yeah, to cultivate your attachment and your self-compassion and all those things? So it, um, it takes different forms. You know, it's... Um, there's a fullness to my life and my contributions and my involvements. Yeah. And so it's everything from, you know, it's the Scottish blood in me, but needing that those cups of teas, but it's always <laughs> yeah. that, that almost cue to, to pause and just to come to stillness. And sometimes, you know, the more distressed I am, the more stressed I am, the fuller the day, the more that kettle is on. <laughs> right, and so it, it can be as simple as that ritual of making and drinking a cup of tea while it's hot. I'm an early riser, and so I end having this golden retriever. I said I wasn't going to talk about her. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, we want to hear it. about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, she what we we start our day at dawn and head down to the beach here in Lake Ontario and. And I know that helps me to ground and to center. And it's typically how I begin and end my day. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there are, I think there's maybe 25 different exercises, practices, meditations, um, experiences that are part of the Mindful Self-Compassion program. And so, you know, engaging in my own practice, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, affectionate breathing practice or a loving kindness or, you know, asking myself, what do I need to hear? What words of kindness can I offer myself? Or I really welcome hearing right now. So yeah. those are also resources for me. And yeah. community is so important. You know, I, I facilitate circles of practice. I teach courses and yet I get to go along for the ride. You know, I'm in offering them, I receive them. And so mm. I appreciate kind of the structure and the routine that means, you know, that I'm engaging in this work, in these practices, in these approaches in quite a consistent way. And yeah. so, um, yeah, those are a number of ways that I continue to take care of myself. Yeah. So, what would you say are the three sort of best things about those practices? What are the three sort of key reasons that you continue to sort of do those things on a daily basis? Um, they remind me of my humanness. <laughs> you know, sometimes often those words, you're doing the best you can. <laughs> you're doing the, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it's okay. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a sense of humility and reminder that being human is hard, right? And, it, you know, I, that I'm not alone with this. Mm. So it's kind of that putting it in context, if you will. Yeah. Um, that, you know, I, I, I would, you know, think of Paul Gilbert and all these systems, the soothing system, the drive system, the threat system, 
a lot of the time we're in threat, a lot of the time we're in drive. And so I yeah. need to be intentional around balancing these. And so these different ways kind of helps to counter the output, mm. right? And, and the different yeah. things that I'm navigating, the stressors in my own life so that I kind of come back to this place of calm and center and grounding mm. so that I can from that place determine what's best or what I need or how I'm going to protect myself or what I'm, how I'm going to assert myself. It comes from that yeah. place of wisdom. So you mentioned sort of like fight or flight. Oh my gosh, I can't even spit it out. Fight or flight or freeze sort of responses. Um, yes. But what are the, what are the challenges that you face, if any, when sort of doing these practices? So uh, maybe I can speak from participants who maybe are engaging with these practices for the first time. And one thing we, we are very um, committed to kind of in, informing and encouraging people from the outset is to take care of themselves. That when we begin to connect with our hearts, I know for myself, when I first learned uh, and was engaged in a program for mindful self-compassion, I was like, oh, my heart. My heart has such longing within it. Yeah. This heart has been broken in so many places. I hadn't really tuned into that. Mm. And so sometimes, you know, as, as, as Chris Germer says, as the love begins to come in, as we begin to intend to be kind to ourselves, as we engage in ways of being kind to ourselves, as we practice, you know, love reveals all that is not. And so, you know, it can be the kind of the rising of the pain that these hearts have been holding can be alarming for people. Right? I thought I was being kind to myself and now I feel badly or I feel like I've been triggered. And, mm. and so uh, this can, can happen. And it's, as he would say, it feels like kaboom, but it's really kabloom that we're really revealing yeah. what our hearts have been holding. And here's again where resourcing ourselves to meet this pain from the past with kindness, to know when to open, to know when to close, to know to when to step back from a practice and go make a cup of tea, um, to know when to get support if mm -hmm. kind of deeper things have been revealed is really, really important. Safety, emotional safety is very important in embarking on this adventure, we might yeah. say. Interesting. Can you sort of explain maybe what you mean by emotional safety? Um, so when we think of, I'm so visual, so <laughs> kind of the, the sort of the zones of tolerance that, you know, if I'm learning a new approach or say learning about mindful self-compassion, then the ideal space to be in is one where I'm growing, mm -hmm. right? And there's energy and I may be stretching myself at times, however, it can become overwhelming and I maybe start to stress myself and it, I kind of can lose sight of the lesson and the meaning and maybe I'm triggered yeah, and okay. I've gone back there. Mm. Um, and so we need to know how to resource ourselves and get back to a place of safety where, you know, where I feel grounded and centered and secure in order to begin to approach the learning again. Yeah, fascinating. So you've mentioned like sort of different kinds of practices, probably like three different sort of practices. Do you set up a certain time to do these? Like do you make sure that you sort of carve out time in your days or in your weeks to sort of do these things or do you find they just sort of naturally occur? Both. I'm going to say that I have my routine you know, I have my morning practice that includes a golden and a cup of tea, but also a sit, right, to kind of to kind of um, practice some of these, the meditations that are part of this. And, you know, a lot of people, when I think of our part participants, 
think that that's the way, right? I've got to be able to do that. Actually, my wish for people is that when a moment of struggle or suffering arises in life as life unfolds, that we know how to resource ourselves. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm really encouraging the people, whether you call it informal practice, but, you know, whether it's, you know, standing in line or dealing with an irate driver next to in the car next to me, it's like, how do yeah. I take care of myself in those moments? Mm. Um, so we can think of everyday mindfulness, everyday self-compassion, as well as, you know, the, the more formal practices that we can review and engage in and rehearse so that we are building that foundation and base mm. that we can draw upon yeah. more easily in life's moments. Definitely. Wonderful. So we're going to go into some audience questions now. So we've got a few questions from the audience here. So the first question I have is, um, does having unhealthy attachment styles necessarily imply that one's level of self-compassion is also unhealthy? I'm very fascinated by this question. <laughs> unhealthy attachment styles, self-compassion, unhealthy. Hmm. I, I wish the person was <laughs> to, to clarify. Yeah. You know, there's so much research. Kristen Neff and others have done so much research on self-compassion um, that really I can only think of reasons that are healthy in terms of self-compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, we can think of self-compassion. There are a lot of myths around it that it's self-pity, that I'm self-indulgent, that I'm, you know, going to become too soft. And yet yeah. it's really the opposite that the practice, maybe it's the word self that can get in the way of people. Um, Definitely, you know, yeah. it's really, in many respects, we're in this approach, we're beginning to focus on the self but but then the knowing is and the research says that the flows of compassion if i'm more compassionate to myself i'm more compassionate with others my relationships are healthier with others that i'm kinder to others that you know it's sort of it's demonstrated that that it has the opposite of what you might imagine or maybe what the the audience member might imagine yeah yeah. So my next question we got is, um, can being kind to ourselves compensate the lack of emotional relationship with others? Can, what was the last part? Can the... uh, can being kind to ourselves uh, compensate the lack of emotional relationships with others? Sorry, I hesitated there. Yes. No, yes. Um, you know, we we kind of wish that other people would look after us, would meet our needs, would take care of us. You know, people may not be available, may not be there, may not have the capacity. One of the exercises that we engage in is meeting unmet needs. And it's really acknowledging, kind of, kind of sifting through maybe the layers of emotion we might feel around a situation or a relationship or the absence of relationship and really opening to recognizing what we might need, whether it's, you know, I need to feel a sense of connectedness or I need to feel valued or appreciated or I need to feel loved. Mm -hmm. And again, as we cultivate, you know, the relationship with our compassion itself, that part of us, can do its best to meet those unmet needs. You know, uh, if it's to feel connected, I'm here for you, right? I'm, I'm with you. I'm at your side. If it's need to feel valued or appreciate, I see you. I recognize you. You, you are, have meaning and purpose. If we need to feel loved, just, I love you. So we can begin to take care of the hurt, the wounded, the vulnerable parts of ourselves yeah. by bringing forth 
the caregiver that lives within. Mm. Lovely. So that is all our audience questions today. So we're going into the last part of the podcast now, which is open mic. So this is essentially where the guest that Christine gets to talk about anything that she's passionate about, anything that she wants to discuss. So I'll hand it over to you, Christine. Thank you, Tia. Besides golden retrievers, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, can talk um, about those all day. So, yeah, I'm really just real. I'm grateful that um, for the opportunities I've had to connect with a global community, and so. My learning through that is no matter who we are, no matter what our first language is, no matter where we've grown up or what country we're from, you know, I've, I have great opportunity to cross paths with people from all continents. And the, the beautiful thing is when kind of there's this cross representation of the world within a classroom mm. and people that are drawn to this approach of self-compassion who are hard on themselves, who want to be kinder to themselves and struggle with that to, to be in a community with others from all over the world is a beautiful thing. Mm. And so, you know, I, I think of, I often think in lyrics and songs and, on, you know, our world so yeah. needs love, sweet love, right? And Definitely. so if we can come together as a global community and to develop ways of being kinder to ourselves, knowing that there will be a ripple effect within our homes, within mm -hmm. our neighborhood, within our communities, that we, that this will uh, influence. I often think of all these bright lights all over the world. Maybe they've got to be pink bright lights. That, you know, people that <laughs> yeah. are are doing their best to um, send compassion inward and also to radiate compassion outward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, having that global scale just sort of yeah even going back to COVID not to bring it up again but yeah going back to that and that sort of global scale of how sort of no matter who you are and where you are and sort of what kind of side of the world you're seeing you everybody needs that that love and compassion and everybody needs yeah those those beacons of of light and love and I think yeah we're so grateful for the fact that we had technology during this time um, mm -hmm. to be able to FaceTime people and be able to connect with people and, yeah, even sort of meet new people in ways that we've never met each other before. And I know I was, like, at uni during COVID and, um, yeah, even, like, sort of you see people in the Zoom classroom and then you would see them in real life, like, 12 months later and they're like, oh, wow, <laughs> you're a lot taller than I thought you were or <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and it's hilarious and it's kind of a different sort of experience that, um, yeah, like majority of us have not kind of had that sort of issue, I guess, before in terms of, yeah, being able to recognize someone in real life versus online. It's a, it's a new fascinating um, kind of side that we're seeing to the world. But it's also, yeah, it can come with so much love and sort of gratitude in terms of, yeah, being able to, build those connections with people in times where yeah we we were not really able to do that in real life um but yes so that pretty much brings us to the end of today's podcast thank you so much christine for being here it has been such a wonderful joyous educational time um but for those who want to find out more about you and what you do uh where can they go so um, my website is probably the best way. It's christinegraceandcommunity.com. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the, the best way. And Perfect. certainly can find me in upcoming courses through both centers of mindful self-compassion and mindfulness studies and, and just be in touch if there's any way I can <laughs> be of support. Great. Well, thank you so much, Christine. Thank you, Tia. Good to connect with you this way. Yes, exactly. Thank God for technology. <laughs> <laughs> 
You have been listening to Bouncing Back, the personal resilience science insights podcast produced by the Life Management Science Labs. Listen to episodes from LMSL's 10 Life Management Perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or other podcasting apps on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps others find us and us grow to bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pr.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Tia Hama. Thanks for tuning in.